I would say that cryptocurrencies are a bubble. If you invest in areas that you don't know, ultimately you're not going to do well. You know, I always say you should do what you're passionate about. I happen to always found investing from a very young age to be fun. John Paulson made Wall Street's most lucrative trade of all time. One of our investors called me and he said, uh, John, I just got the monthly results. I think there was a mistake. It was no mistake. Paulson's bet on the collapse of subprime mortgages in 2007 earned his firm $15 billion, the largest one-year payout in the history of financial markets. It's kind of like finding a, a needle in a haystack. Paulson's 2007 performance rocketed him to the ranks of superstar managers. At its peak, his firm managed $38 billion, making it one of the largest hedge funds in the world. It opened up a lot of doors and became very interested in terms of the people that I met. Paulson has yet to repeat the success that made his fortune. Recently, he joined a list of industry legends to quit the hedge fund business, converting his fund into a family office. Personally, I never really liked the, the business side of the business. I did like the investing side. He's also enjoyed giving away his fortune. He pledged $400 million to Harvard University and donated $100 million to the Central Park Conservancy. I wanted to give back to the, uh, the institutions generally that were important to me. John, you made one of the most famous investments in Wall Street history. Um, over a period of time, you put a short on an effect, to make it simple, on the mortgage market around 2007 or so. And that trade, it is reported, made roughly $20 billion or so for you and your investors. Uh, nobody has reported anything more profitable than that, than that in the Wall Street, I'd say, last couple of decades or so in one trade. Um, did you have any doubt that that trade was going to work? Well, we were, we were pretty convinced uh, that uh, the mortgage market, segments of the mortgage market were overvalued and were likely to implode. So we took a, uh, a very concentrated position in these securities, and what we expected to happen happened. It can't be that easy because nobody else quite did what you did. So uh, at the time that you were doing it, did you have any sleepless nights saying, hey, I might be wrong and maybe I'll lose a lot of money, or you didn't really worry about that so much? Well, again, you know, it was structured where the downside was very limited. I think the reason why other people didn't, hadn't done it is because there had never been according to Moody's and S&P, a default of an investment grade mortgage-backed securities. Mortgage-backed securities were viewed as the safest securities uh, next to treasuries. And that was essentially true up until that point. What they missed was the, the underwriting quality had never been as poor of securities as it had been in that period. So the fact that they hadn't defaulted in the past had, had nothing to do with whether or not the securities that were being issued would default in the future. The idea for doing this, was this something that came to you one day when just reading the newspapers or watching Bloomberg on TV, or, or did somebody who worked for you come with this idea? Where did the idea come from? I developed a specialty, which very few people do, in shorting credit. The difficulty in, in shorting credit is you have to get a borrow. They're generally a liquid, so you can never get size. Uh, but I never gave up on looking, and finally we found it in the, the mortgage-backed securities market, which at the time was larger than the Treasury market. So there was literally unlimited liquidity. And because of the development of the uh, uh, credit default swap market, uh, you didn't have to get a borrow. So there was synthetic securities, uh, just people trading synthetically on uh, uh, actual bonds. and. You can do 100 million. Uh, we were doing 100 million on a clip, 500 million a day with banks, in some cases, a billion dollars a day uh, with banks. So there was massive liquidity to set up these positions. So when you did your famous trade, you became world famous. Before, you were relatively unknown to the public. Um, how did that change your life? All of a sudden, people are calling you all the time. High school friends are saying they always knew you were going to be successful, and they're mm. calling you for contributions or whatever else. How did your life change? Well, it was very funny. I remember the, the time that it happened, David. One of our investors called me. He said, uh, John, I just got the monthly results. I think there was a mistake. It said 66%. You meant 6.6%. 6 
And I said, no, it was 66 percent. He goes, well, that, that's, that's impossible. I, I've invested with Soros, with Tudor Jones, with, with everyone. No one's been up 66 percent in a year. How can you be up 66 in a month? I said, well, that's what happened. Shortly after that, all our investors got these results, and it leaked out to the press and then became a, you know, the cover story in the Wall Street Journal, which was picked up globally that we had this incredible performance in uh, February, up 66 uh, percent net. And uh, that performance uh, continued throughout the year. The funds wound up being up close to 800 percent net for the year. And, uh, you know, it was became, a, you know, opened up a lot of doors and became very interested in terms of the people that I met. It was reported in the press that you had to write a check at one point to the federal government, IRS, of over a billion dollars. Does it feel nice to write a check over a billion dollars or a little bit painful to the IRS? Well, we were big supporters of not only the U.S. Treasury, but also New York State and New York City. So we, uh, you know, we paid, you know, a fair amount of taxes. So you don't have in your office anywhere a check that says a billion plus the U.S. government? You don't keep that check? Yeah, I don't keep the check, but I do keep the tax returns, both the uh, state tax returns and the federal returns. So I've asked you from time to time outside of this setting uh, when I've seen you, do uh, you have any other good ideas like that one? And you've always said to me pretty much what you just said. If you have something good, you would let me know, perhaps, but you have anything as good as that. Is that right? You haven't had anything as good as that yet. I would say not as good, but I would say the, the uh, area that's most pr mispriced today is credit and, um, and, the, and the, the potential, you know, in the, the, I think the 10-year Treasury is, is about 1.3 percent and the 30-year Treasury bond is 2 percent. And we're coming into an inflationary period. I think the PPE came out today, and it was over 7 percent. The CPI came out yesterday. It was over 5.5 percent. So you have uh, inflation, current inflation, uh, well in excess of, of long-term yields. Now, there's a perception in the market that this inflation is transitory. I think they bought the uh, Fed line that it's just temporary. Uh, due to the restart of the economy, and it's eventually going to subside. However, if it doesn't subside, or if it subsides at a level that's above the 2 percent that the Fed is targeting, or stays in the 4 percent, 3 to 5 percent range, then I think ultimately interest rates will catch up and bonds will fall. Um, in that scenario, uh, so, you know, there are various option strategies related to bonds and interest rates that, uh, you know, could offer very high returns if interest rates do move up to those higher levels. But when you've had a um, kind of a life-changing event or an unbelievable uh, success, as you did with that trade, is there a temptation to say, I don't want to tempt fate and try it again? Or, is this, or do you want to prove that you can do it again and you're looking for another deal just as good as that one? You know, we do look, but you have to be realistic. Uh, you know, we have put on some uh, trades that, um, you know, on smaller scale that have uh, potential returns of 25 to 50 to 1 uh, related to uh, both interest rates and gold prices. So, you know, our, 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 our viewpoint is that the markets are currently too complacent regarding inflation and that if, if inflation does prove to be higher than expectations, that will result in both higher gold prices and higher interest rates. And if you get those two happening at the same time, in a period of time, uh, we can set up positions that could, you know, return from 25 to 50 to 1. Now, after you made your famous trade that we talked about, yeah, I think you put on a trade where you bought a lot of gold or gold futures, and you were a, what was called by some a gold bug. You're a big believer in gold. Gold's now about $1,700 an ounce or so. Are you believing that gold is now a good investment at this price? Yeah, we do, and, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, we, you know, we do believe that gold uh, does very well in times of inflation. So what happens is, if you own long-term treasury bonds that are yielding two percent, and interest rates move up to five percent, those bonds fall materially in value. Uh, likewise, if you have cash sitting in a bank that you're earning 0% on, inflation's 4%, you're gradually eroding the value of your money. So as inflation picks up, people try and get out of fixed income, they try and get out of cash, and the logical place to go is gold, uh, especially if it starts to rise in, in inflationary times. 
but because the amount of money trying to move out of cash and fixed income dwarfs the amount of investable gold, that the supply and demand imbalance causes gold to rise. And the more it rises, it sort of feeds on itself and has the potential to go uh, what I call parabolic. So today, you are a big believer in gold as a good investment now? Yes. Yeah, so we, we thought uh, in 2009 that with the Fed uh, doing quantitative easing, which is essentially printing money, that that would lead to inflation. But what happened was that the Fed, while the Fed printed money, they at the same time raised the capital and reserve requirements in banks. So the money sort of recycled what the Fed bought treasuries, created money, wound up in the banks, and then was redeposited at the Fed. So the amount of excess reserves at the Fed almost rose by the same amount they were printed, and the money never really entered the money supply, so it was not inflationary. This time around, uh, the money has entered the money supply. So the money supply was up something like 25 uh, percent last year. And the, the best indicator of inflation is, is money supply. So I, I do think we have inflation coming well in excess of what the current expectations are. I'm not a believer in cryptocurrencies, and I would say that cryptocurrencies are a bubble. So let's talk about for a moment uh, where you think the economy is going. Um, you've mentioned inflation. I should say when I worked in the White House under President Carter, I was responsible, I'd like to say, uh, for the double digit inflation. Obviously, others were involved as well. But I don't know if we're getting back to there. But are you worried about inflation? Is that your principal concern right now in terms of the economy? I wouldn't say I'm worried about it uh, because uh, if we don't have any, we have zero fixed income. So. Uh, inflation wouldn't hurt our uh, fixed income company. But we are, we do believe we will get more inflation than the market is currently expecting. So we've positioned our portfolio to benefit if we do get more inflation. So uh, if inflation does become more embedded at higher levels than anticipated, that will uh, benefit uh, you know, a good portion of our portfolio. What about interest rates? Do you think the Fed has kept interest rates artificially low for too long? Have they kept it artificially low? Uh, yes. Have they kept it artificially low too long? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, we, we went through probably the worst financial crisis imaginable uh, with COVID in which the eco entire economy shut down. And if it wasn't for the very aggressive policies of the Fed, and the uh, Treasury, we could, have, uh, we could have delved into a deep recession. But provide, by providing all the monetary and fiscal stimulus that they did, they really minimized the downturn, uh, resulting in a very rapid recovery, uh, allowing the economy to uh, uh, you know, have a minimal, you know, minimal GDP contraction and a very sharp uh, GDP correction. And uh, today, are you worried about the size of the debt and the deficit in the United States? Absolutely. So uh, we did borrow a lot of money in order to stabilize the economy. But at some point, uh, that money either has to be paid back or monetized via higher rates of inflation. So paying back is, is very confiscatory and would likely result in slower uh, growth and uh, a long period of slow growth. So the easier alternative is to monetize the debt via inflation. And the way that works with inflation, GDP grows uh, more rapidly on a nominal basis. And since debt's expressed in nominal terms, the debt to GDP ratio can come down uh, with, with inflation. So ultimately, I, I think you'll have a choice and inflation will be the more desirable outcome. People are always looking for bubbles that are going to burst. And uh, one of the most significant ones that burst you picked up, which is the mortgage-backed security uh, market a couple years ago. What about uh, the SPAC market? you think that's a bubble waiting, waiting to burst? I don't think it's quite a bubble, but it's clearly uh, elements, shows elements of a frothy market. There's just too much liquidity. Uh, so I would say the SPAC market is overvalued, that people that invest in SPACs in general, on average, will be a losing proposition. 
Okay, what about cryptocurrencies? Are you a believer in cryptocurrencies? No, I'm not a believer in cryptocurrencies. And I would say that cryptocurrencies are a bubble. And uh, I would describe cryptocurrencies as a limited supply of nothing. So to the extent there's more demand than the limited supply, the price would go up. Uh, but to the extent the demand falls, then the price would go down. There's no intrinsic value to any of the uh, cryptocurrencies, except that there's a limited amount. Well, based on what you've just said, why would you not put a big short of some type on cryptocurrencies, or maybe you have, but do you think that's a good short? Well, um, you know, w when we looked for the subprime, the, the reason why we shorted the subprime in size is because it was asymmetrical. You're shorting a bond at par that has a limited duration that trades at a 1% spread of treasury, so you can't lose more than the spread in the duration. Uh, yet, if it defaults, you can make the par amount. In crypto, there's, there's unlimited downside. So even though I, I could be right over the long term, in the short term, as the case of Bitcoin, you know, went from 5,000 to 45,000, you know, I would be wiped out on the short side. So it's just too volatile to short. While John Paulson is shunning the crypto craze, many of his peers in the industry are wading deeper into it. Earlier this summer, Steve Cohn's Point72 was hiring a head of cryptocurrencies. The fund told investors it would be remiss to ignore a $2 trillion market. Meanwhile, the family office of billionaire George Soros has started trading Bitcoin. Macro trader Paul Tudor Jones has begun investing in crypto. And Dan Loeb says he was doing a, quote, deep dive. Now, the big financial institutions such as Goldman Sachs and Citigroup are getting in on the game. The result? hundreds of job openings. Binance, the world's largest crypto exchange, is advertising for 370 jobs. Still, is the talent pool deep enough to fill everyone's needs? A single job posting may attract hundreds of applicants, but finding candidates with the right experience can be difficult. So, some firms are lowering their expectations or changing job criteria. I always say the best investment for an individual, an average individual, is to buy their own home. So your firm was uh, a hedge fund in the hedge fund format. Um, hedge funds have different types of uh, investment approaches. Yours was, is it fair to say you were more of a macro investor or is that not fair? Uh, we, were, we were sort of risk arbitrage. Our specialty was two specialties, merger arbitrage and bankruptcy reorganizations. For people who don't know what risk arbitrage is, what actually is risk arbitrage? Well, it's, it's primarily investing in, in mergers. Uh, when a deal is announced, um, let's say a stock's trading for $30 and someone's offering to buy it for $50, and after the uh, merger's announced, the stock goes to $48. So there's a $2 spread, uh, and it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but $2, let's say over 50, is 4%. So if the deal closes in, in, in four months, to do that three times a year, so three times four would be a 12% rate of return. So the the so if you can have a portfolio of these uh, deals, and and uh, they all learn about the same thing, you can make a steady return. The beauty of it is, if the market goes down, uh, as long as the deal closes, you still make the same 12% annualized return. So the returns are uncorrelated with the market direction, but correlated to the risk in the transaction. So it's called risk arbitrage because you have $2 on the upside, but if for whatever reason the deal breaks and it falls to where the deal was before it was announced, $30 is a lot of downside, $18. So you play for $2 on the up, $18 on the downside, so that's why it's an arbitrage, but it's, it's risky if, you don't, if you, you, know, you don't know what you're doing. In your view, to be a good investor, what are the qualities? Is it hard work, uh, some luck, uh, good contacts? What are the qualities that make a good investor and the kind of investor you have been doing? Well, you definitely need 
a lot of training. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues to understand from a legal investing uh, business standpoint. Uh, so, uh, you know, before you start investing, you, you really need a, a lot of experience. And depending on the type of investing, depends on the type of experience. So, uh, someone like in, in risk arbitrage or private equity, probably the best place to start is mergers and acquisitions. We become familiar with valuations and merger agreements and uh, takeover laws, and, and then you could apply that later on to purchasing companies on your own behalf or trading in the securities of companies undergoing mergers. So when you're at cocktail parties, do people come up to you all the time and say, you got any good ideas for me, or that doesn't happen all the time? Sometimes, but uh, you know, the worst thing is to give someone a, an idea you know, casually, and then it turns out the wrong way, you feel terrible. So it's, you know, I prefer not to give uh, investment advice. So what's the best investment advice you've ever received? Um, I think the best thing is to invest in areas that you know well, that, uh, you know, you can be lucky, uh, anyone could be lucky in a particular investment, but that's not a long-term strategy. If you invest in areas that you don't know, ultimately you're not going to do well. So the most important thing is to invest in areas, to concentrate on particular areas that you know better than other people in that area, and that's what gives you an advantage to succeed in investing. And what is the most common mistake that you think investors make? I think that they look for get-rich-quick schemes, and they buy based on stories, and then uh, they chase investments that are going up, and ultimately those investments deflate, and then they lose money. So if somebody came to you and said, John, I just got $100,000, what should I do with 100000 What would you tell well, them? Well, I always say the best investment for an individual, an average individual, is to buy their own home. So uh, if you took that 100000 put 10% down, get a 900000 mortgage or whatever, you can buy a home for a million dollars. And you, know, you just reported that home prices were up 20% in the last month. So if you bought a home for a million dollars with 100000 down, and the home was up 20%, that's 200000 on a 100000 investment, you'd be up 200%. And over time, Essentially, that's what's going to happen. The longer you wait, the more the house is going to appreciate and the greater return you'll have on your equity investment. So I think the single best invest investment for anyone with that type of money would be to buy their own house or apartment. And uh, what do you think, uh, for example, you would tell people not to invest in? Or is there something you'd say, do not ever invest in X, Y, or Z? Well, now, I'll have a lot of people that disagree with this, but I, I would think you know, you shouldn't invest in cryptocurrencies. Ultimately, I think cryptocurrencies, regardless of where they're trading today, whether they go up from here or down, will eventually prove to be worthless. So there is no value to them. It's just a question of supply and demand. And once the exuberance wears off or liquidity dries up, these will go to zero. So I, I wouldn't recommend anyone invest in I think cryptocurrencies. Of all, of all the things you've said in this interview, I think that's probably going to get the most attention from people, probably. We'll Possibly, see. Possibly, yeah. And you hope your children will get into the investing world at some point? Well, you know, I always say you should do what you're passionate about. I happen to always found investing from a very young age to be fun. So I like buying things, selling things. I like uh, making money and the independence that earning money gives me and allows me to have a lifestyle. Uh, so that's what I like. but. You can't force that upon someone. So the most important thing is to pursue your passion, because you can be successful in anything. You can be successful in music, dance, uh, medicine, physics, math. Uh, the important thing is that you, you, know, you pursue a career in what you're naturally passionate about, and that will, that will improve your odds of achieving success.